Posterior model probabilities are measures of uncertainty, but they're also uncertain themselves. Let me explain. We're going to take a deep dive into meta-uncertainty in Bayesian model comparison. My name is Marvin Schmidt, and this is joint work with Stefan Radev and Paul Christian Bergner, published at AIS Dets 2023. This is a presentation about Bayesian inference, so obviously we're going to have to start with Bayes' theorem. So Bayes' theorem establishes a connection between the posterior distribution of parameters of interest theta, conditional on data y. And this is established by the likelihood, the distribution of the data condition on the parameters, multiplied by our prior belief about the parameters p of theta normalized by the marginal likelihood of the data, P of Y. The marginal likelihood of the data is the joint distribution of data and parameters integrated over all possible parameter configurations. This integral is typically really nasty and hard to solve. That's why we have methods like approximate Bayesian computation, Markov chain Monte Carlo, and plenty of other um, Bayesian methods to draw samples or estimate this posterior distribution. Let me set the stage. We're always going to talk about a data generating process here for a data set Y. A data set Y could look like this regression um, data set on the right hand side. And this can be formulated as a hierarchical data generating process. So we're going to be comparing different models. So the first step is to define a model prior distribution, P of M. So prior belief about the models, whether or not they're equally likely or one model is more likely than the others before seeing any data. And we will draw a model index from this prior distribution of the models. So we have a true data generating model M star. Then we're gonna take a draw a sample from the prior distribution of the parameters of this model we get theta, and then we can finally plug in theta and the model index into the likelihood function of this model M star, and we can finally generate this data set Y. The next step, if we have different competing models in this model comparison setting, we can compute posterior model probabilities, which is just a way to say Given this observed data set Y, how likely is each of my candidate models? It's an alternative or an extension of base factors, if you're familiar with this, and it's also a prior based model comparison um, method. So if we have three models and a fixed data set Y, then one example of such a vector of posterior model probabilities could look like the one here on the right and the triangle visual and the triangular visualization where for a fixed data set y model one has a probability of 10 percent model two a probability of 20 percent and model three a probability of 70 percent so it's seen naturally that this point in the triangle here lies closer to m3 um, we achieve this vis visualization by simply interpreting the posterior model probabilities as barycentric coordinates, but it's not that central here. So posterior model probabilities are nice and they have um, desirable properties such as consistency. But as I have stated in the introductory quote, posterior model probabilities are measures of uncertainty, as we've, as we've established earlier, but when we compute or derive those posterior model probabilities from a finite number of observations, they still contain epistemic uncertainty themselves. So here's an illustration of that. In this setup from Ulrich et al., they have a fixed data set Y, and instead of just computing the posterior model probabilities once, they do it a hundred times, and each time they do another bootstrapping sample, so resampling or reshuffling, uh, resampling of the data. So these data sets are slightly different. And what we see here are um, the results of this posterior model probability um, evaluation 
we see that slight changes in the data through bootstrapping drastically changed the results to extreme evidence for other models. So in this um, figure here, we see whether or not there has been a decision for one of the competing models with a posterior model probability of more than 99%. And in fact, we see uh, among those 100 bootstrap repetitions, in some cases, we see extreme evidence for model 3, for model 4, for model 7, or for model 8, just by slightly changing the data. So we see two issues here. One is overconfidence. That is, the posterior model probabilities concentrate on one of the candidate models. Even though this concentration is not robust, which is the second problem, the dance of base factors or dance of posterior model probabilities, that is, by only slightly changing the data, we see drastically different evidence. So they pretty much jump or dance around. This motivated um, us to use the fact that we have Bayesian models and we can generate data from our candidate models and take a look at this overconfident and dance in a principled Bayesian way. That is, we repeat this data generating process from earlier, not just once, but many, many times. So the first data set that we generate just from our prior, so a sample from the prior predictive distribution, in fact, um, in this case, it would select the model M2. So we sample parameters from model M2, we plug them into the likelihood of model 2. And so on the left here, you see in this scatter plot, you see a simulated data set. Now it's important to note that this data set is simulated. It's not yet observed. And we're gonna denote simulated data by YS and the resulting posterior model probabilities on simulated data by pi s. Later on, we're going to incorporate observed data and we're going to denote this with this decorator O, but more on that later. So for the simulated data set, we can compute posterior model probabilities of each candidate model. And in this case, we observe or we, we see, we compute that we have roughly balanced posterior model probabilities. And because the data was were generated by model two, we're going to put the posterior model probabilities as a visualization, like as a point, um, grouped under M2. It's going to make sense later. For the second simulated data set, we draw model index M3. So we also sample parameters from the prior of model 3 and um, plug it into the likelihood of model 3. Again, we compute posterior model probabilities and we see, um, again, that they are roughly balanced. We repeat this 10 times and we see that we get a different pattern for data that's generated from each of the candidate models. When we repeat this 100 times, in fact, we see how those patterns emerge. For instance, data that's generated by M2, so the middle triangle here, have roughly balanced posterior model probabilities and in some cases we have larger evidence for M2. Data that's generated by M3, so in the rightmost triangle here, sometimes has large evidence for M3. See with those this point which represents one data set. It's really close to M3. But then again there's also one data set that has large evidence for M1. So we see a substantially different pattern here which is just a visualization of the dance of base factors again, of the dance of posterior model probabilities. And so now we take it one step further and treat this distribution of posterior model probabilities as data and construct a Bayesian model on this distribution of posterior model probabilities. So we now only need to pick a distribution that's suitable to fit data in a probability simplex. One such distribution might be a Dirichlet distribution, but in here, because we want a distribution that's a bit more flexible, we choose a logistic normal distribution. So for each of those triangles, if you will, we fit one Bayesian model. Then again, we get a posterior distribution of the parameters of this model, 
we get a posterior predictive distribution which again lives in the um the, the data space and the data in this case are the posterior model probabilities so i'm going to show you the visualization of the posterior predictive distribution now and maybe it makes sense now so we essentially fit a whole bayesian model onto these model implied distributions of posterior model probabilities and up to this point all we've worked with are simulations in fact so now we have our meta models which capture the essence of the behavior of what posterior model probabilities look like under each data generating process that we want to compare only based on simulations until now and now the actual data come into play <laughs> So imagine you're a practitioner and you um, you observe data in some sort of experiment. So you run run a field experiment and you have three candidate models. And now you actually want to compute observed posterior model probabilities. And what we're going to do now is that we will augment these observed posterior model probabilities by everything we've learned in our simulations. And that's the result here we construct a mixture distribution and the weights of this mixture distribution are your observed posterior model probabilities. So here on the right you see the observed posterior model probabilities which are about like 15% for model 1, 70% for model 2 and about 15% for model 3 as well. And now if we use these observed posterior model probabilities as, ma as uh, mixture weights for the posterior predictives of the meta models, we gain a notion of what we can expect the next posterior model probabilities of another observed data set to look like. Let me say it again with a different example. If we observe extreme evidence for model 3, you might wonder, are we being overconfident here? And our meta-uncertainty framework would give the result, yes, you're probably overconfident because typically data that's actually generated by model three wouldn't even yield such extreme posterior model probabilities for model three. So instead of just um, taking these observed posterior model probabilities, which are essentially one or 100% for model three by face value, we say, okay, hold on, wait a minute. Um, we're going to mitigate this large overconfidence and say, okay, listen, if you were to uh, conduct this experiment again, if you were to repeat it, you shouldn't expect these extreme posterior model probabilities to actually replicate. But you should expect some like moderate or moderately strong evidence for model three, but don't expect it to replicate again. And that's the essence in how we mitigate overconfidence here because we will still retain this uncertainty from the simulations of the dance of the posterior model probabilities this is always retained even if the observed posterior model probabilities are extreme in favor of one model so to give you a brief conclusion um, we use simulations to augment observed posterior model probabilities or model comparison results in general. We uncover overconfidence by visualizing it in a principled way and we also mitigate it by this level 3 predictive mixture distribution. Um, this method has um, especially um, desirable synergies if you're in a setting of amortized inference, that is, if it's really cheap to compute posterior model probabilities on your data sets, um, and you can run those simulations and evaluations really quickly. And this is also an emerging field in, in Bayesian inference, and there are really nice synergies there. But you can also just um, use this method, essentially like plug and play, where if you're fitting Bayesian models in Stan or PyMC or any sort of framework, so this is general and it's not meaning to replace posterior model probabilities or compete with leave one or cross validation, but more to put your observed posterior model probabilities into perspective, into a probabilistic context of the models that you're actually comparing. You will find the um, paper in the proceedings um, of AI stats. And if you have any questions, um, feel free to shoot me a message anytime. Thank you.